Excellent. Okay, guys. Um, so most of you know me really well. I know we have a few um, new people in the community on here. So I'm going to go ahead and um, take a minute to introduce myself. I'm Param. I'm a radiologist in Southern California. And I started investing in real estate almost 10 years ago. And I um, I was able to get to financial freedom at 41. Um, and uh, we, I then went on to build the Generational Wealth MD community. We're at this point 10,000 members strong. Um, it, we're, our, the goal was to educate people, break down the barriers to investing in real estate um, and provide resources to, uh, for those who are looking to invest in real estate, be that direct ownership or passively investing in real estate. Um, I think, Alex, I need to mute you. Indra, are you in a position to mute people? Um, I'm not. I'll go ahead and log out and log back in. Okay. Um, I will take care of it for now. Sorry. Um, okay. Sorry. We may not have had the setting where everyone gets muted automatically. But anyways, um, so GW Capital is... Uh, well, you know, we created GW Capital just to serve our community with passive real estate investment opportunities because there was a huge need for it. At this time, we're at over a thousand dollars and 185 million in assets under management. And the goal has been to really provide vetted, curated syndication opportunities to the community. Um, and a big part of GW Capital is also to educate people. And we have tons of resources and I, I hope all of you are taking advantage of it. Uh, but 2023 was um, a, was a year of tremendous growth. We acquired Park 33 in the summer, and we will be closing on Stewart's Mill, our current opportunity, um, within the next month. Um, and I'm very excited to see where we're headed in 2024 and beyond. A lot of you probably heard me say this. Um, 2024 is going to be a year of uh, opportunity. There is some distress in the multifamily sector. We're going to talk about that. And that's specific to um, a small subsection of assets. But um, I think we're perfectly positioned to take advantage of those opportunities. I do want to take a minute to talk about our charitable mission, GW Gives, uh, because I think uh, we have a lot of our investors and uh, coaching clients on this call all of you country help us make the mission possible, right? All of you help make the mission possible. Um, uh, GW Gives is focused on empowering children in rural India with disabilities by providing them with healthcare and education needs. Um, and um, I, I want all of you to feel pride in it. And so that is impact investing. And that's what we really take pride in. Um, and I want you to feel like you're a big part of it because you make it possible. Okay, getting into the uh, into today's presentation, I think um, what we're going to start off with is going to be um, talking about the U.S. economy, talking about we're going to talk about inflation, interest rates, right, the good, the bad and the ugly. Um, and then talking, we'll talk about the fundamentals of uh, multifamily right now as it stands. And then we'll go over all of our assets. Uh, it's, we, we like to do this every quarter where we go over the assets performance. Most of you already have the PDF, the performance report email sent out to you via email. So I'm hoping if you have any questions or concerns, we have the ability to go over that towards the end. So make sure if you have any questions to drop it in the in the chat and we'll take the time to go over all of that towards the end. Okay. Uh, Indra, I believe we forgot to have a setting where everyone is muted when they enter. And so if you can just make sure everyone as they enter, they are muted, I'd appreciate it. Okay, let's do this, guys. You know, we like doing the webinar format, the meeting format instead of the webinar, because towards the end, if you want to unmute, I get to see everyone's faces mostly. And towards the end, uh, you get to unmute and um, actually be part of the discussion if you want to. It's just a more um, intimate experience. But when we do make the mistake of not um, having the setting set up right, then occasionally we do have this issue. But that's a note to the team to make sure we're doing that correctly next time. Okay. We'll do our best to get through this without interruptions. Um, so for those of you on here who are considering investing in um, real estate passively in, in, you know, in apartment syndications, 
uh, this is a, 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 a you know um, a very useful resource that we created uh, a couple of months ago, generationalwealthmd.com slash guide in lowercase. And um, it's a completely free resource where I try to go over the basics of investing um, passively in real estate syndications. What you need to know, I think the most important thing is going to be how do you determine what your buy box is? Um, there's a spectrum even within real estate syndications. And even within each deal, you have multiple options to pick from. So I want you to identify what your needs are based on your goals, your resources, really create a buy box so that when you're evaluating an opportunity, you know that it makes sense for you. And then I go over vetting the market, the deal, and the sponsor um, in detail, right? Uh, but again, it's it's all starting from a very basic level. And so I think it's going to be useful for most of you who are getting started and even those of you who have been investing passively, just to give you like a really clear due diligence checklist that you can use every time you're evaluating a deal. So um, if, you're, uh, if you haven't downloaded this and you haven't had a chance to take a look at it, I highly recommend going over it. I think it usually takes about an hour of focus time to go through it from, um, you know, from beginning to end. Um, there are lots of graphs in there. I try to make it um, simple. And then if you have any feedback, feel free to uh, to give me any feedback you have. Okay, perfect. Let's get started, guys. So, um, you know, every time we do this, I try to give you updates in terms of what's happened over the quarter. Um, and most of you know that uh, the current high interest rate environment was all because the Fed is trying to control inflation, right? And so let's see where inflation and uh, in the interest rate numbers have landed. Inflation peaked at 9%, um, and then it dropped to 3%. And the last two months, we've been at about 3.7%, uh, right? So we're, it's, it looks like we're in a holding pattern over there. And in response to that, um, you know, the Fed has incre increased, uh, you know, interest rates, but they, the last two months, they've actually not had any hikes per se. Um, and so... In that sense, you know, I think we're in a, you know, in a position where we're at a standstill and we're holding. The hope is, and what most people anticipate, is that the Fed is not going to raise rates significantly beyond this point, but they are likely going to hold rates at this point. Um, the question is, for how long? Uh, most people anticipated rate cuts, maybe Q1, Q2 of 2024. But I, I always say this, we're not really looking at you know, best case scenario. I, I think we shouldn't even look at reasonable case scenario. If we are underwriting and planning for worst case scenario, then we're doing the right thing, right? Especially in the current environment. And so worst case scenario, the Fed is likely going to hold rates at this level for maybe um, another eight to 10 months. Um, and they may not start dropping rates unless something breaks or if we go into a recession. Okay. All the indicators though at this time point towards a um a soft landing. We'll talk about that more in detail. But I think the important thing for us to remember as investors is that historically speaking, and this graph down here, this is just showing you what interest rates have looked like. Uh, oh, so the red line over here is what Fed fund rate has been. Um, so historically speaking, we're actually near the long-term average of where interest rates have been in the country, right, uh, across decades. So we're not in a super uh, relatively we are in a higher interest rate environment, but overall, uh, you know, uh, interest rates have been much higher in the past. In the 80s, they were all the way up to 18%. It's important to keep that, uh, you know, to keep have that perspective. Um, and the other thing to remember is that in a high uh, interest rate environment, um, not sure what happened there, but uh, I guess the important thing to remember is that in a high interest rate environment, um, inflation, I'm sorry, in a high inflationary environment, that's usually, it usually benefits real estate investors, right? Um, and so it's not necessarily the worst thing for real estate investors. If you look at this graph, it just shows how historically speaking, um, every time you know, inflation was high, that's the blue line over there, right? The CPI is reflective, uh, uh, indicative of uh you know, where inflation lands, what that looks like. Um, whenever we have a high uh, inflationary environment, um, real estate NOI grows, right? So because it's an asset that's correlated to inflation, it's not necessarily a bad thing for those of us who are investing in real estate. Um, okay. In terms of, let me see if I can move this bar over a little bit. Okay, perfect. In terms of uh, rate cuts, um, you know, the average time between first uh, hike to first cut is about 24 months, which is why there is this expectation that possibly in Q1 to Q2 of 2024, we'll see, you know, rates start dropping. But like I said, 
Worst case scenario, we may be holding in this pattern for a little longer, right? Um, and and something may something may have to break uh, before the Fed considers dropping interest rates. Okay. The important thing for any deal that you're going into at this point, and for anything that you're currently in, is then going to be the ability to hold the deal till 2025 or 2026. Um, and we'll talk more about that, how we've changed our strategy, and what you should be looking at specifically as you're analyzing deals as we go forward. Okay, um, so I think that was mostly like, you know, interest rates and inflation. That's what most people think is if you were talking about the bad and the ugly, that's where I think, uh, you know, that's what people tend to interpret as being bad or ugly. But like I said, it's not necessarily the worst thing uh, in the world in terms of interest rates and inflation also being high is not really bad for real estate investors. Now, the other thing is um, national average rents, right? Um, and this is something we need to look at because this affects our net operating income. Um, rental growth has slowed down. In most markets, rental rent growth has, is plateauing. Um, in some markets, there's even a slight dip um, in rent growth. Now, again, this is necessarily true for an asset that is stabilized, that is in holding pattern. Our goal as we go into these assets is always going to be to um, add value to the asset, right? Do a rehab and increase the rent. And so when you look at our portfolio, as we go over the portfolio performance, you'll notice that um, despite overall market rents, um, you know, sometimes even going negative or if, or at least flattening out, we are seeing rent growth in, in all of our properties. And that's because, because we are going in and doing value add. But this is important to remember. And the reason is because, um, when you're evaluating deals, you want to make sure that um, your the the you know the operators are actually um, they have conservative assumptions in there. So we don't want them to be super aggressive in terms of what they have, what the assumptions they have in terms of rent growth. You want to make sure you're checking that um, and that it's in line with what is and what we anticipate for the next few years. Um, the, the good thing is that um, income growth has been keeping up with rent growth, right? Um, and that's important because you really want people to be able to, you know, pay the higher rents um, that we've seen in the last over the last uh, two to three years. Um, so that's a positive sign. Um, and I think the other thing to remember is that housing affordability is down. The gap between what people have to pay for a home right now between home prices, you know, having gone up significantly and the interest rates. Uh, so the gap between what someone has to pay for a mortgage and what they have to pay on rent is the widest that we have on record, right? Um, and I, I think these numbers are a little dated, but the truth is that compared to say two years ago, if someone had to purchase, I would say two years ago, if they had to purchase a home that was 400,000, they would be paying about 1300 and now it costs about 2200, right? Uh, so when housing affordability goes down, that does increase demand for rental. So overall, this is a positive sign for those of us investing in apartments. Um, and then when we look at the overall market, uh, you know, a recession is technically when you have two quarters of negative GDP growth. Uh, we have Q3 numbers in there, we're still seeing positive growth. And so that is a good sign. Um, it just shows that the economy is still resilient. Um, we're seeing that across the board, unemployment rates haven't necessarily gone up significantly. We're still at about 3.8%. Same thing with corporate profits, uh, with uh, retail sales. Um, even when we look at total US total savings deposit. So what is the, you know, how much capital do people have? How much money do they have available? Um, household equity is still holding strong. Um, obviously it isn't as great as it was say maybe two years ago during the pandemic, but uh, they, it's still strong, right? And so uh, it is flattening, but it's still strong. Okay. Um, and then typically, I mean, this graph just goes to show how among the different asset classes, right? Because some of you may be investing in office, some may be investing in retail or industrial. Uh, apartments, the vacancy in apartments has typically been the lowest uh, during periods of recession. So multifamily residential apartments are still a strong asset class to be investing in. Um, and finally, if we look at but, so this is another really important thing, right? What's the demand supply mismatch? Um, and that really speaks to the underlying multifamily fundamentals. Um, we are still in, um, you know, in an environment where we have a shortage of housing. Now, 2024, we will see more supply hitting the market, but um, but that you can't look at that in isolation. Um, construction financing is in short supply right now, which means that between 2025 and 2027, we're again going to see uh, you know a decrease in in new construction. 
hitting the market. And overall, over the next 10 years, we still are short about four to five million units um, as far as multifamily housing is concerned. Um, and that's the important thing, right? So we still have a supply shortage. Um, and um, those, they they just speak to really strong fundamentals for multifamily housing at this point. Okay. Um, and I'm going to talk about uh, multifamily distress on the next slide, but uh, the important thing, and those of you who follow the yield curve, right? Whenever we have yield curve inversion, um, that typically signifies that we may be going into a recessionary period. The, I, I think, positive sign is that the yield curve is still inverted, but it's less steep than it was earlier in 2023. So um, I think we're more just based on the data, right? It looks like we're heading more towards a soft landing than ever, um, just based on the data. And um, that really uh, gives us confidence, essentially, in, you know, in um, in the real estate market, in the economy overall. So let's then talk about multifamily distress, right? So you will hear a lot of people talk about multifamily distress that is likely going to um, actually be more prevalent in 2024. Now, if you look at it, and I mentioned this before, there's a small subsection of multifamily assets that are more likely to to actually um, show this, you know, um, to have distress uh, come 2024. And, um, you know, and I've spoken to multiple people, this is a consensus opinion, uh, where the areas for potential distress are going to be a in development projects, right, uh, where they didn't really anticipate the, the interest rate hikes and um, inflation and, and costs going up. It's also going to be in specific markets where there's high supply, also in markets like San Francisco where, uh, you know, expenses went up, but rent control just means that the people, you know, um, uh, we weren't able to raise rents and therefore there's a mismatch over there. So we will see distress in those markets. But I think uh, the biggest area of concern that most people are talking about um, is going to be in assets that were acquired between 2021 and early 2022, where they had short-term variable or floating rate loans. Now, some of you may be invested in assets like that, and um, you will identify that the, you know those assets do have challenges, and that's because they were originated at a low interest rates, and they will now need to be refinanced at higher rates, where at the same time, we did see a correction in the market and you know in some areas by 10 to 15%. So you have a loss of equity and you have um, higher interest rates. So that's where we're likely going to see um, the, the distress in 2024. Now, that being said, assets that were acquired in 2020, they benefited from the rent increases, right? So you really won't see too much distress over there. Anything that was acquired after mid 2022, we already saw those interest rate hikes happening and um, underwriting was very different compared to an asset that was, you know, being acquired in early 2022 or in 2021, right? And that's why that shot, um, that space where the assets that were acquired in 2021 and, you know, the first half of 2022 are likely the ones where we're going to see the most distress. But what this also means is that while you hear people, and, and this is true market psychology, right? Um, the highest risk in the real estate market was in 2021 and 2022. Um, the highest risk for multifamily because of um, commercial lending, right? The highest risk was then, we've already seen a correction um, in, pr in uh, prices in most markets, 10 to 15%. Uh, when we're underwriting now, we're underwriting expecting rates to be where they are and if the, de the deal needs to make sense with the current interest rates, right? Uh, and so, overall, there is less significantly less risk in the market right now. And this is where, you know, when they say fortunes are, are made in the downturn, you know, it's these periods where there is a lot of fear. Uh, this is where we also have a lot of opportunity. And so, but again, the most important thing is going to be knowing how to really vet the deal. Look at the, you know, look at the debt, um, look at the actual fundamentals of the asset, and then make a decision. And that's why I highly encourage any of you who really want that resource or want a due diligence checklist to go over the guide that I talked about. That's generationalwealthmd.com slash guide in lowercase and go over that and just use it as your checklist every time you're reviewing assets. But, um, you know, I know a lot of us are very uh, interested in having a checklist, but I think more importantly, um, it's going, the, yeah. the buy box, I think is, is really, is going to be really helpful for many of you. Cause I think that's okay. where um, it's okay. going. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Let's see if we can. Oh, hi, Rua. I'm going to mute you really quickly over here. 
Okay, you did it. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and so building that buy box is going to be really important because oftentimes we start with the how, how do I do this? Um, what do I need to know? But the why is the important part, right? It's like, uh, why am I investing? What are my goals? And what makes sense for me? What's my risk return profile? And where do I want to stay on there? And so I think that's, that's, in my opinion, the most important part of that, uh, of the entire uh, work, the, the the book. So make sure you take a, a look at that and then come up with your criteria and stick to it. That's going to be really important. Okay. I want to quickly talk about um, how we have pivoted, right? Because we're not investing in this market um, exactly how we did say two years ago. You always want to be conservative, but now more than ever, you want to make sure you're doing things right. The fundamentals, the, the basics of our strategy are going to remain the same. We're always investing in landlord friendly markets. That just makes it easier if you have delinquency um, and tenants who aren't paying to go through the eviction process, right? And then laws are favorable. <clears throat> Excuse me. I am recovering uh, from a bad cold. Sorry about that. Um, and then more importantly, we're in you're not really looking for market appreciation right now. I always say in most of the deals that we go into, we're looking at stabilized value add deals where you are getting cash flow from day one, positive cash flow. That is going to be really, really important. And you really want to look at the fundamentals of the deal to make sure that's happening with. Um, and when you're looking at a deal, you want to make sure this positive cash flow based on current income. And based on increased expenses that you're going to have when the asset is acquired, right? Because property taxes and insurance will likely go up, right? So based on the on the current, like you know, in the present moment, is this asset cash flowing with the new debt that you're going to put on it? That's going to be that's going to be critical. But uh, ideally, it's it's in especially in the current market, you want to make sure you're you have some sort of value add plan where you're able to increase the rents and increase the equity in the property. Um, and then obviously the tax efficiencies, right? So I talk to a lot of you who are at this point looking at a lot of debt deals and you're gonna see more of that in 2024. And um, so one of the disadvantages of investing in um, say debt deals or you know, um, or doing short-term trading is that all of those um, are tax inefficient. So you're paying taxes at your marginal tax bracket. But when you invest in real estate syndications, and we've talked about this in the past, we can deep dive into it if anyone wants to, uh, you know, talk about that in detail later. But it's tax efficient, which means that you get, and then especially this year, right? So if you get into any deals this year, you still can take advantage of 80% bonus depreciation, which means you get paper losses, um, you know, year one, uh, which really uh, ensures that you don't pay taxes on the distributions that you get. Right. So it's tax efficient. You're tapping into those tax efficiencies. Value adds going to be important. Positive cash flow day one is going to be really important. But and then, like I said, the most important thing is going to be your ability to hold on to the asset, which is where you want to look at the debt that is acquired. Right. And that's going to be super important right now. You really want to make sure you look at the underlying assumptions. Um, and if you don't see this on the um on the, uh, oh, the offering memorandum that's provided to you, make sure you ask uh, your sponsors for um, you know, the detailed underwriting spreadsheet and ask them to go over the assumptions that are in there. And that's uh, when you go over the guide, it actually deep dives into it. So you know exactly what to look for. It's basically five things that you need to look for, but I think it's a good exercise for any of you uh, who are trying to vet deals to take a look at that, right? So having adequate cash reserves um, and um, having the right debt and conservative assumptions is going to be super important. Um, I think I have another slide in terms of how what we are specifically doing. If you look at a lot of the deals that we've gone into in 2023, um, if two of them were assumable loans, right? We were assuming loans that were under 4% interest rate from the seller. We're purchasing assets at a discount, um, right? And then um, if we aren't getting, um, you know, assuming the loans, we are getting trying to get fixed debt or uh, have a really tight rate cap with flexible exit options. That's important. And that's something you want to make sure you're assessing when you're looking at deals. Um, and um, we talked about cash reserves. So in an attempt to hold on to adequate cash reserves, sometimes we've shifted our strategy from, you know, the the, the premier renovation package to partial renovations. Uh, we are trying to make sure we go in with a lower uh, uh, LTV, which means the loan on the asset is smaller. Uh, that gives us an additional buffer. Um, and another way to do that is 
when we have to spend money towards um, rehabs, if we can do that without drawing from the lender, that's another way to make sure that we aren't really um, encumbering the asset with more debt, right? So these are things that we are doing in, a, in order to adjust our strategy. I think it's important to understand this and really you know, have, do your own due diligence on assets you're, um, on any deal that you're getting into. Okay, so coming back uh, to this quote, don't try to time the market. Um, I do believe that uh, we are in a period where there is less risk in the market. Uh, but again, um, it's really important to be doing our own due diligence. And I want to educate you to make sure you feel comfortable doing it. And we can, any questions related to overall uh, due diligence, vetting, feel free to drop it in the chat. We'll get to, get to, to it towards the end. But I think the what I like to talk to people when I talk to them about their goals, and if any of you have, just have talked to me, you know, we, we usually come down to, it usually comes down to this, you know, what are you doing with your capital? And I think when you start out, you need to have a plan. Now, um, if you look at the returns we're projecting, you know, we usually like to project, um, so we under promise and over deliver, that's always the goal. But the returns that you saw, say in 2021, when you were exiting deals versus what you're seeing today, um, the returns are probably going to be uh, lower, right? So we're looking at something between 15 to 20% average annualized returns for a class B investor is what we're looking at. When you look at that, it may seem like uh, it's lower, but I think the, the important thing is to keep it in perspective, right? Uh, Vanguard released data saying that over the next 10 years, they expect US equities, uh, the returns to be at about 5%. Right. And so that's because that's where the economy is going to be for the next five years. And um, and, um, you know, when you compare that to real estate, we're still able to get, say, two to three times um, the return. Um, and then that's where you really need to you know, look at the risk profile of the asset also. Um, and that's where all the vetting comes in. But we're, that's what we're looking at. 5% is what we expect to see uh, the equity market do over the next few years with, um, um, you know, the same thing, um, cash. If you have cash, your cash is losing value at this point, right? Uh, because in, we're still at a 3.7% um, inflation rate. And uh, in, there is a huge advantage to investing in hard assets indexed to inflation because your returns are not going to be just the cash flow that you see. So you may have an asset like Stewart Small that we're going into where we anticipate to have about a 5% cash and cash for our class B investors day one. And that's likely going to increase as we execute the business plan. But you have so many other ways of uh, you know getting returns over there. You have the tax efficiencies. You have forcing appreciation where we're building up equity as we do those uh, the, the rehab on the asset, right? And we're raising rents. We're using leverage. A lot of different ways where we're really boosting our returns. And so it's important to keep all of that in perspective. Decide what you want your asset allocation to be and make sure that however you're investing is aligned with that. Okay, um, I'm going to go into the assets uh, really quickly, talk about their performance. For those of you, for our investors on here, um, we did send out uh, a more detailed Q3 uh, performance report um, that should have hit your you know, inboxes. We'll be sending that out again with the replay. So make sure you go through that. It's uh, it's definitely more in depth. I'm going to go over some of the highlights. I did want to take a minute to talk about Stewart's Mill, which is the current opportunity that we have. Uh, we... Uh, Anyone who is interested, uh, there's a QR code over here. You can get on the wait list. And, and right now it's uh, on a first come first serve basis uh, in terms of whether we have availability in the deal. But again, this is one of what I like to say. It's our typical bread and butter deal, right? Stabilized value add. What that means is that it's an asset that's already built out, right? It's a 188 unit um, multifamily apartment where we're going in day one for class B investors with about a 5% cash on cash day one. And that keeps hitting your bank account, um, you know, monthly. That's what the projection is. But we go in and we add value to it. And we're increasing the plan is to increase the rents and increase our equity in the property by doing the value add, right? So that's your bread and butter. And then the question then is, how are we de-risking this, right? How do we ensure that this is a safe deal? That's where, you know, this is a deal with 95% occupancy. This is a market, and I was there last month. This is a market where there isn't a ton of supply hitting the market, right? So we know those occupancy numbers are going to be maintained. It's right next to downtown Atlanta, where there is a huge industrial corridor um, and diverse, the um, you know, industry diversification is going to be key whenever you're looking at any market and analyzing it. Again, it's a landlord friendly market. We're going in with fixed agency debt for five years, right? Agency debt is safer debt, right? Unlike bridge debt. So going in with fixed agency debt for five years and we're locking it at about 6%. Um, and even with that, the, the deal is cash flowing day one, right? So 
th those are the ways we we also acquired it at a you know um four million dollar discount all of that just gives us that buffer and that's how we de-risk the deal right and so our projections for um average annualized return that should say aar uh is between 16 to 18 percent for class b and c investors um and uh if anyone is interested in i should have put the link in here it's actually generationalwealthmd.com slash atlanta3 all in lowercase um, and uh, you can go take a look at the webinar. I usually do a detailed webinar talking about the risk um, return profile of the deal, how we de risk it actually going over the entire uh, the uh, um, the OM uh, during that presentation. So if you want to learn more, um, just go on to generationalwealthmd.com slash Atlanta three in lowercase and you should be able to take a look at this deal. But um, again, we have economies of scale because we have multiple assets in um, the Atlanta market. And that helps us because, uh, you know, from a property management and a contractor perspective, but also from an exit perspective, if we're trying to sell it to an institutional investor, we have multiple exit options. So um, again, um, these slides are actually in the presentation deck. I'm gonna quickly go over this, um, probably use this as an educational experience also, right? So uh, typically with most deals, we have three classes. Um, reserve class usually requires a larger initial investment. So this may not be applicable to most of you. It does give you a better profit share. I mean, we have some of our reserve investors on here. Um, and so what happens is that overall, it bumps your average annualized returns up and you get a higher preferred return, which just means that for every year that you uh, are in the deal, uh, we project that you will get about an 8% return from pure cash flow. Um, and if we don't hit that in the beginning, that accrues and you will be made whole towards the end, right? So reserve class investors get a higher preferred return and a higher overall return because of a better profit share split. But, uh, you know, class A and B investors, this is where you have optionality, even within, um, you know, an individual deal, there are so many different ways to invest. Class A investments are typically for those of you who are looking for, more steady cash flow, right? This is where on a consistent basis, you're getting about a 9% um, um, return hitting your bank account every month, right? Prorated. And you don't really get profit share towards the end, but it's more consistent cash flow. With class B investors, you're, you have a 7% preferred return, but like I said, probably starting out getting 5%. Um, and that's pretty high for the current environment. And that's why I, I, I like this deal. Because like I said, cash flow day one is going to be important. That's one way to de-risk the deal, right? Because even if for any reason occupancy drops, you're still in, in a cash flow positive territory. So that becomes really important in the current environment. So uh, you start off with a lower cash flow hitting your bank account. And there's some more variability over here because it depends on how much cash flow you have. Uh, class A investors typically get paid out first and then class B investors get paid out. But uh, what you do get is profit share towards the end. So that really bumps up your average annualized returns. And I like talking about AAR because um, that's an easier way to compare these returns to say stock market returns. But the IRR, um, internal rate of return, is a better way to compare to real estate investments, especially syndications. Um, um, yeah, so uh, that's just without getting into too much detail over there, right? Uh, okay, so that's uh, that's about Stuart's mill. Uh, and hopefully it was also um, helpful from, you know, the perspective of how do I structure things? And, you know, with the class A and B investments, you also always have the ability to do blended returns where you feel like, okay, I want some, uh, I want to be cash flow heavy, but I also want some of the upside. You also have the ability to invest in a combination of A and B. So that's another way to structure your returns. And that's why it's important to really know what your buy box is and what makes sense for you. Okay, um, let's move on. Let's talk about uh, Bronte, uh, which is our uh, Bronte East and West. That's our portfolio in Mesa, Arizona. Um, we actually uh, are past the 12 month mark over here and we did uh, a, you know, um, a deep dive last quarter. So if you want to take a look at Q2, the Q2 performance report, you will actually have more information in there. But, um, you know, typical to all the deals that we look at, every time we do rehabs, just wanted to point out some of the positives over here. We're always looking for the ROI, right? Every time we do a rehab, are we really increasing rents to the point where uh, we have a significant return on investment? And we ideally want this number to be greater than 15%. Um, and consistently with most of our assets, we are uh, above 20%. So we're at 27.5, which is a great number, which means that even in this environment, as we're doing the rehabs on these assets, we're able to increase the rent significantly. So it still makes sense to go in and do that, right? Um, same thing with job estimates versus what we're actually spending. Um, again, we have 
pivoted from complete, uh, you know, the premium um, rehab to partial renovations in some uh, some of our uh, units. And that's because we really want to get that, you know, maximize our ROI end of day and want to hold on to adequate cash reserves. Like I said, that's going to be important in this environment. And so uh, there's a, actually, we were, uh, uh, our cost, actual costs are, um, you know, um, million and a half dollars less than what we anticipated to put in. So again, uh, we're being very conservative in terms of how we're spending um, in the, you know, in the Phoenix market per se, uh, the, the market is softening, the rental market is softening, we're seeing rent decreases. And you can see that on this graph. But again, this is temporary. Typically, in the winners, we do see this. Um, and so this is not, you know, this is a cyclical change also that's superimposed upon everything that's happening in the market. And so we anticipate this to be temporary. If you look at this graph, uh, CoStar data uh, in 2024, we expect rent, um, you know, rent, um, rental rates to start going back up again. That's the forecast. And so uh, I wanted to present that just so that we know where the direction we're heading. Now, for this particular asset, we are struggling a little bit with delinquency, but we did have bring in new property management and they have a new rent collection system. And we're really hoping this is going to give us a head start um, to really um, turn things around over here with this property. But overall, if you remember this from um, the 12 month uh, financial analysis, rents are up 20% in the property. Average monthly NOI has increased by 22%. Um, and uh, uh, the DSCR has increased from 80 to 95%. And we're going to, uh, we're shooting to get about one, one um, as soon as possible. And so all the detailed information is available uh, in the uh, in the PDF that we'll again, we'll send that out again um, along with this, uh, with a replay. But um, the Phoenix market per se has been hit, um, and this asset uh, in particular has been hit with by what I call the trifecta. Interest rates hike. This asset was acquired mid-2022, and we had a rate cap. But again, we didn't anticipate rates to hike up as quickly. Um, the market per se is seeing a softening of rents and um, more of a market cap rate decompression. That's something that is out of our control. Um, we did have more delinquency than we anticipated, and we have steps in place, but that has really affected the NOI of this property. So we have paused distributions on this. Some of you are in this deal, um, and uh, you know, uh, in support of uh, our investors, we haven't been taking RSN and GW Capital have not been taking asset management or construction management fees and all missed distributions will accrue and be caught up. Um, but we have shifted our strategy. We are doing more partial rehabs. We have a rate cap that expires in July, 2024. Um, and the, the cost of the new rate cap is high right now, but it, again, this is going to fluctuate as interest rates fluctuate. So we're hoping we're gonna be in a more favorable interest rate environment. That being said, our goal is to push NOI up by another 45 to 50%. So we're not really relying on interest rates to affect our DSCR. Um, and we're actually taking concrete steps ourselves. Um, just an example of the, the rehab. So really taking those assets, um, you know, to a, to a higher level um, and um, more pictures in there. Okay. I um, want to talk about our Greenville asset next, uh, Pelham Place. So this is our 12 month mark uh, for the Pelham Place asset. And you'll have detailed information um, again in the PDF, but just the highlights. Um, NOI has increased by 33%. So that is like a huge win. We have been able to reduce delinquency by 81%. Um, again, um, that's that's huge. Um, expenses have also been reduced. Uh, I We actually have highlights in terms of property taxes and uh, the water saving program. And I'm excited to share that with you. We've discussed that in the past. But again, uh, even over here, we're seeing a 24% uh, ROI. Again, like I said, anything above 15% is, uh, is what we're targeting. So getting close to 25% is really good in terms of the least trade-outs we were able to obtain for the renovated units. Um, and as far as the property tax bill reduction, um, this is something we had planned to execute and so it was part of the business plan. But again, um, uh, it you know, we were able to execute on it. We were able to reduce just, uh, you know, by keeping our rents um, below a certain number and making, um, you know, the, the apartments affordable, we were able to get a 61% tax savings as far as the property tax goes. And then, and this is like actually a really cool example, you know, even from an educational perspective to see what happens when we reduce expenses and in bump up the net. So you can bump up the net operating income by either increasing income or reducing expenses, right? So when we did a water conservation project and 
um, you know, in this asset. That gives us an annual savings of $45,000. Um, and when you factor in that we're probably at a five cap in that market right now, just having that annual um, expense reduction by $45,000, that translates to all close to a million dollar increase in property value, right? That's, to, that's usually how the value add um, um, strategy works. And that's what we're trying to do, right? Go into an asset that is currently cash flowing, right? We're not really um, in the development space at this point uh, with the variables. And so that's typically higher risk, uh, higher reward. And so we try like to stay in that, you know, stabilized assets that are cash flowing, that are already, you know, occupancy about 90%. That's what we love to be. But when we go in and we reduce expenses, this is how we're ha able to have, or we raise income, right? A significant impact on the actual property value. Okay, so same thing over here. Um, we There's a 65% reduction in terms of actual cost versus what we estimated, which is what we, you know, in the current environment makes absolute sense to do that. I'm not going to go into this, but this, the actual detailed information is available in the PDF, but I really wanted to take this, uh, the uh, opportunity to talk about, uh, I know a lot of you reached out to me because you're also exploring debt deals currently, right? So, um, and you're probably going to see more as a community, like as investors, we're going to see more debt deals uh, come our way in 2024 as we start seeing more multifamily distress, right? And so a lot of these deals will need capital to be infused for to stabilize the deal and for the operators to be able to hold on to the deal. So if you're taking a look at a deal, um, I, li I like saying that there are a few things um, you know, um, there is definitely less risk if you're on the debt side, but the important thing to remember is that often there's a tax implication to it, right? So if you're getting a 12% return, um, that's not the same as getting a 9% return as an equity investor because A, you're paying marginal tax, uh, you know, taxes on um, in your based on your marginal tax bracket, right? So for most of you, that's 40 to 50%. So that's important to remember. The other thing is that even um, even if you're a debt, you know, investing on the debt side, I think it's important for you to take a look at the deal, right? Because there, there are two aspects to any deal, right? There's the debt and then the, there's the underlying fundamentals of the deal per se. So I really want you to take a look at occupancy and delinquency of the asset, right? This is how you do your due diligence, even if you're investing on the debt side. And then always make sure you're looking to see what the net operating income is and how it's increasing, right? How it has been performing since the asset was acquired. Um, you also want to know what the debt service is, what the net income is after debt service has been paid. Um, and then the DSR is actually just a, ra a ratio, but it's a simpler way of understanding um, how much income you have after you've paid your, the, your debt service or mortgage payment, right? And so ideally you want this number to be above 1.25. You want it to be above one for it to be healthy, right? So um, that's what I want you to look at, occupancy, delinquency, and then net operating income. And then if you can look at DACR, those will be the numbers you want to take a look at. And so um, if you need data for our current assets, that's going to be in the, um, in the Q3 PDF. Sorry about that, guys. Okay, um, so now uh, what else? Uh, let's talk about, uh, so the, again, same thing over here, um, the overall Greenville market did see, uh, you know, negative 3% rent drop, but we have been able to consistently grow rents. And this is because, like I said, we're not basing it on market rent growth or, um, you know, market appreciation. We're actually going in and doing, a, we have a value add strategy, right? Um, so that's the important thing to remember here, but we are going to be slowing down unit renovations because we don't, uh, you know, overall uh, occupancy is dropping in the overall Greenville market. Um, and so we, at this time, we, we want to slow down renovations and be intentional about how we are spending our uh, CapEx dollars. Um, again, so this is the data for occupancy. The overall Greenville market uh, is sitting at 13.8. So we're still above market uh, average. And our goal is to get to, you know, the holiday season. After the holiday season, our, our goal is to get to a 93% occupancy, 93% uh, plus occupancy. Um, and um, we're going to maintain focus to try to achieve that. Uh, I think uh, as far as the overall business plan, um, this asset has fixed rate debt at 5%. Um, till September 2025. We are, like I said, we're going to slow down renovations. Um, all our Class A investors have been getting full distributions. Class B and C investors 
um, have been getting about 50% of pro forma. And that's because we had unforeseen plumbing costs and that's actually in the detailed report and a slightly lower occupancy. And we can see that's mostly because the overall occupancy in the market has dropped a little bit. But um, our goal is to just um, ensure that we have tight operations and we're constantly working on improving. We've done a great job of delinquency. And now we're gonna try to work on um, occupancy and get it to that you know above 93%. Um, again, we haven't taken any asset management fees and all missed distributions will be will accrue and be caught up on sale. I think they did a great job with the rehab. Um, I don't have any pre images, but I think um, overall, um, and I think Reed's wife was part of the design committee. They've done a great job. Um, okay, moving on. I'm going to wrap this up really quickly for those of you who have questions and they're more generic questions. We probably have two more assets to get through. Um, Elevated Eagles Landing is, uh, you know, our asset in Atlanta, Georgia that we acquired. That was in 2022. So anyone in here was able to get a uh, hundred percent bonus appreciation. Again, this asset was acquired at a 20% discount. And um, we have 10 year agency debt uh, with six years of interest only 5.3% uh, with a tight rate cap. So again, great debt, another solid institutional class asset occupancy um, has been, you know, above 90%. Um, and you can see all of that data in the uh, the report. Delinquency dropped from about 80,000 when we acquired the asset to about 17,000. So again, um, a lot of um, positive, um, you know, everything's moving in the right direction over there. Full distributions were released for September. And if anyone has any questions, um, you can always contact us at uh, admin at gwcapital.com. Um, McDonough, this is another, uh, this is like a sister asset, another um, institutional class asset, 252 units, 3.6% um, fixed interest rate, which is amazing. Um, low leverage, 57%. And again, acquired at a 20% discount. We closed on this in March. Um, I was there last month and a um, lot of uh, exterior upgrades, um, the, the sports court area, the pool, exterior painting, it just looks, it looks really nice. A lot of positive feedback from the current tenants. Um, and then um, unit rehabs are also underway. And uh, I think I have some pictures over here. And this is from when I was out there. Um, it just like the, with the new paint, everything just looks very spruced up. Um, and the tenants are loving all the changes. Again, another asset where we made strides with delinquency, it has dropped significantly. Uh, occupancy has been a challenge with this asset currently. And that's because um, when we acquired the asset, we had a lot of uh, non-paying tenants who needed to be evicted. But if you see, um, I believe occupancy went down to 80%, but we are back up to, well, September was 85.7, but October when I was there were close to 87% pre-leased at a higher number, um, over 90%. And uh, we believe that it's slow season, but in Q1 of 2024 will be 90% plus. That's the goal. And um, everyone is uh, super focused on that. Again, full distributions were released. And so if you have any questions, make sure you shoot us an email. But all the NOI numbers, all of that is going to be in the, um, um, in the Q3 report. Um, Park 33, we closed on Park 33. Again, this is another, um, I believe the first distributions went out the second week of November. Um, another institutional class asset, this is much newer, 2018. It's a core plus asset. And so when you look at the uh, guide, you'll notice that there's a spectrum, even with um, even with multifamily assets. And so you have your you know, ground up development, which is higher risk, higher reward. And then you have your core assets, which are brand new assets that are cash flow positive, but really not a lot of scope for value add or pushing up rents and um, equity. And so the returns are gonna be lower, but lower risk. Um, and core plus is uh, somewhere in between our you know, bread and butter value add and our uh, core assets. Um, and this is one of our core plus assets. So heavy cash flow from day one, which is something we really like, you know, greater than 95% occupancy, they actually have a wait list. Again, really safe um, agency debt at 3.6% for seven years. This was assumed from the seller. So very strong fundamentals, distributions were out. Um, and if you haven't received yours, just let us know. Uh, we've had... This, I believe 2023 is when we've had the most in-person events. I love in-person events because it allows you to connect with the community, form those strong bonds, learn from others, share resources, um, and really work towards goals because a lot of this is you know, having the right mindset and being surrounded by the right uh, people. Um, and uh, we don't really have the next in-person event planned, but we will be sending um, um, you know, emails out as soon as we know what we're doing next. 
we do have the Physician Freedom Summit coming up in March of 2024. And um, we had one in 22, uh, we had one last year um, where we had 15 speakers uh, show up and we talk about everything from general finances, how you need to set things up, not necessarily real estate related, right? Even investing in the stock market, your trust, asset protection, um, uh, insurance, everything, right? We're really like a very comprehensive look at that, a look at physician entrepreneurship and burnout prevention. But what we're going to do this time is I want to take that's day one and day two and day three, we want to really focus on real estate because what I'm realizing is that um, we're a lot of what we've done in the past has been focused on direct ownership of real estate, but I really want to uh, have one day dedicated to um you know, investors are looking to invest passively in um, real estate now. So in real estate syndications, how you vet deals and bring on speakers who can really um, elevate your knowledge in that sphere. So that's the goal for uh, the Physician Freedom Summit for 2024. Uh, QR codes on there, I believe the link is generationalwealthmd.com. And guys, can you drop that in the chat for everyone? So if you can drop uh, the Stewart's Mill, um, you know, the, the page for Stewart's Mill investment opportunity. And for the summit, I believe it's generationalwealthmd.com slash PFS. That's for Physician Freedom Summit uh, waitlist. And that's all in lowercase. That should take you to the waitlist page and you can sign up for it. Um, I think in the last two years, we've had over 10,000 physicians attend our live our live virtual conferences um, and I'm super excited. I know we'll probably have uh, over 3000 physicians in the Physician Freedom Summit. We really wanna bring value to you. Um, and um, I'm, you know, as always, I'm always here if you wanna reach out and talk about your personal situation um, and get guidance in terms of how, what makes sense for you and um, you know, how you should be investing. Even if you're just investing passively in real estate syndications, feel free to reach out. Um, I love ha having these conversations with all of you. But what we're going to do now is stop and then get to Q&A. And uh, okay, perfect. Let's see if you have any questions. If not, you can feel, always feel free to unmute and um, and we can just have a you know an open discussion. It doesn't have to be specific to any of our uh, the deals that we have. Okay, let's see. Um, Okay, so I think that's just Adrian and um, Indra dropping, um, you know, um, the links in there. So you guys have that in the chat. Hey, Rua. Oh, perfect. Thank you for dropping that in there. Yes, that is the uh, Atlanta 3 in lowercase. That's our current offering. Hey, Preeti. So your question is, um, how should we think about declining occupancy in the multifamily rental market when housing affordability is also declining in the current market? That's a great question. Now, typically, whenever there is concern for a recession or we're, uh, you know, we're heading into a recessionary environment, um, it's, it's, the normal trend is to see declining occupancy. Um, and that's because of household formation. What happens is that people will start uh, living together or moving in together. And that's because people start getting concerned about, um, you know, uh, uh, about, a, an, uh, you know, a recession that's coming, right? So household formation um, start, patterns start shifting and that's what affects occupancy. And that's a normal trend. So market cap rate, decompression, compression, and occupancy, that's typically, when we talk about market cycles, that's what we expect to see. And that's what we're seeing. Um, the important thing is to remember that, and that's why I had the slide, among all the asset classes, residential multifamily tends to have the lowest um, increase in vacancy, right? Um, so occupancy is affected the least over there. And then the, it's usually within a certain number. Now, in some markets, you'll have um, um, a larger effect because of oversupply, right? More supply hitting the market, especially in 20, um, I think from mid 2023 to um, 2024. But again, we're gonna see that correct over 2025 and 2026. And so there is gonna be a fluctuation. That's typically what happens. And often it has to do with household formation. I hope that answered the question. Um, okay. Okay, guys, I think I don't see any other uh, questions. Hey, Ruwa. Okay, I should be looking at my document, which I haven't been looking at, but I'm going to get to that. Um, so your question is, um, if we get in now, uh, do we get tax-free gains in five years? So let's deep dive into that, right? So that's an important question. Let me just take a look at my um, uh, document to make sure I've answered questions from Facebook also. Uh, I believe I have. I'm not really seeing anything in here. Okay, perfect. So uh, let's go back to your question because I think it's uh, it's relevant to most of us, right? So the question is, um, how do the tax-free gains work? Now, suppose you get into a deal, say you get into Stewart's Mill today and that closes 
uh, before the end of 2023. So you're getting 80% bonus depreciation. What does that actually mean? If you put $100,000 into Stewart's Mill, um, then with 80% depreciation, now depreciation only works on, so what your actual loss is depends on multiple things. It depends on uh, how much leverage you have in the asset. Um, and it's not 80% uh, of what you put in, it's 80% of the depreciable basis. You're able to take that um, for the components that have less than 20 year um, useful life. Now, it seems complex. So let's just look at straightforward numbers, right? So if you invest 100,000, you'll get about 45,000 in losses when you get your tax documents for 2023. Now, it doesn't mean the asset is at a loss. Uh, it just means that on paper, the IRS allows you to take that loss because they allow you to depreciate the portion, a portion of the building basis, right? Now, um, what does that 45,000 do for you if it's a loss? Now, if you are, which I think is your case, if you are a W-2 employer, you have 1099 income and you don't have any other passive income that sits in your, the IRS likes to look at your um, taxes, uh, your income as three separate buckets, right? So you have the active bucket, which is where you have your 1099 income, your W-2 income, um, any tips that you get, right? And then you have your passive bucket, which is where you have your real estate income, right? And uh, which is also where you have any other passive income from businesses that you're not materially participating in. So a lot of physicians have ownership interests in um, a surgical center or a, you know, um, a dialysis center, but they are not active in it. And so that pa income hits them as passive income, right? So if you have passive income, either from other rentals, so you have positive passive income um, that isn't offset by depreciation from other rentals that you have. Typically, this happens when you have rental properties that you don't have leverage on, right? Or you have passive income from businesses that you aren't materially participating in then you can take that 45,000 in passive losses that you have and you can use it to offset any passive income you have and you automatically are getting that bump in ROI in year one. Now, for most of you, you may not have additional passive income. So that 45,000 is gonna sit as losses in your passive bucket. What happens and how do you use it? Now, suppose you get 5,000 in cash flow, right? year one, and you get 5,000 in cash flow or 7,000 in cash flow year two, another 7,000 year three. Now, all of that cash flow, typically passive income is taxed at the same marginal tax bracket as your active income, right? Uh, you may not have self-employment taxes, but marginal income tax bracket is the same thing. When you have your 45,000 in passive losses, that offsets uh, any of those distributions that are hitting your bank account on a monthly basis, right? So from Stewart's Mill, you get cash flow hitting your bank account monthly. If you're a class A investor, you'll get about 9,000 each year, right? And that hits your bank account as, you know, as income. Because you have the 45,000 in passive losses, you don't have to, that offsets that um, income and you don't have to pay taxes on it. Now, what happens at the five-year mark? Um, at the five-year mark, uh, there are a couple of things that happen. When we sell the asset and exit the deal, you have two things that happen. You have, will have capital gains tax and you will have depreciation recapture. So that 45,000 in losses that you got, you have to give that back, right? So there are strategies even at that point to, and this is what we do, right? If you owned an asset yourself, you would defer taxes by doing something called the 1031 exchange, right? Same thing with your uh, passive investments. When you get to the point where you exit the asset, there are multiple ways to still defer taxes down the road. That's what you want to do. You don't want to pay gains right now. You don't want to pay depreciation recapture right now. You want to push it down the road because um, the time value of money is important to you. When you have that capital tax-free and it's growing for you, even in five years, if you've invested it correctly, it's likely doubled for you, right? And so uh, that's what you want to do. You want to kick the can down the road. You can do that multiple ways. If you own other assets, so some of our investors um, they own other real estate that they acquired, that, that they are passive in. Um, they acquired them, you know, between 2017 and 2023. They can go and they can depreciate those assets and use those passive losses to offset their capital gains and their depreciation recapture. You may have other passive losses from other syndication opportunities that you enter into that are sitting in your passive bucket that you can use to offset the capital gains and um, the uh, depreciation recapture. If none of those scenarios work for you, and I always say, you know, this, this is when we can hop on a call and discuss this, or you can talk to your CPA. But if that doesn't work, you always have, we always try to give you the ability to 1031. So the entire LLC for a syndication needs to 1031 into a different asset. Those who want to exit will exit. 
those who wanted 1031 will be given the option to 1031. It's not guaranteed uh, because the timing has to work out, but we will always try to have those opportunities available to our investors. And when you do that, you're again able to defer taxes. So I hope that makes sense. The goal is to, just like you would with you know assets that you own yourself, self, the goal is to defer capital gains and depreciation and take advantage of um, depreciation, the passive losses day one to make sure that all the cash that's hitting you is tax-free and that's how you really tap into the tax efficiencies of real estate, right? Okay, awesome. Hi, Priya. Um, Hi, your Pam. question is, hey, I'm your sorry, question I'm is, in the dark. Shall I turn on the camera? You won't be able to see me. Yeah, yeah, that would be great. Uh, I'll just take a, um, I'll try to get, read out your question so everyone knows what we're talking about. Sure, um, you. you are not an accredited investor and your question is, can you still invest? So, um, so for a 506C deal, which is the investments we typically do for syndications, you do need to be an accredited investor. But there are 506B deals where you just need to be a sophisticated investor and you need to know the sponsor. Um, and I've got a lot of questions from some of you who aren't accredited investors. Currently, like I used to have friends who would do 506B deals. But just the transaction volume is so much lower right now. I don't know anyone who's doing them, but I would keep an eye out for other syndication opportunities. And I would ask uh, people if they are 506B deals. So you can invest in passively in real estate if they are 506B deals. We do only 506C, so I don't think our opportunities will ever. Um, the problem is that it's those are SEC regulations. So even if we have one um, non-accredited investor, it, it, the entire deal falls apart. So we can't have non-accredited investors, but you can look for five or six B deals. And then the other opportunity is always going to be to invest in your own assets. Uh, but if you buy a long-term rental that is passive and you have a pro property manager manage it, if you want to stay passive, you still have the ability to do that. So that's the other option. So five or six B deals or investing passively. And then I always say, some of our investors want to be really, really passive. If you can find a partner who's willing to uh, you know, do the work and then you can stay passive in that joint ventures are another way for you to invest. So you'd have tons of options. You just will not be able to invest in a 506C deal unless you meet the criteria. And for those of you um, who, are, who aren't aware, accredited investors need to have uh, individually an income of above 200,000 um, for the last two tax years or as a couple, 300,000 for jointly for the last two tax years or have um, a net worth above a million dollars, excluding your primary residence, that's the criteria. So you still have tons of options. It's just that 506C may not be the best fit for you. Thank you, Param. I still have some other uh, possible uh, options to discuss with you. I did make an appointment with you okay, for perfect. Sunday. Yes. So I'll bring it up then. Thank you so much. Sounds good, I'll talk very to you then. You. My perfect. sister is a radiologist too, so I'm so excited. Oh, awesome, yeah. yeah. To everybody in the family, yeah. Very Thank nice. You. There are tons of radiologists in the community. It's so interesting. But yes, awesome. I look forward to talking to you on um on Thank Friday, you so on much. Sunday. You're so kind. I appreciate you. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Rua, I'm glad that was helpful. Again, if you have any other questions, just uh, for, the tax part can be a little complex. So uh, I do my best to explain it and explain multiple options. But this is where like sometimes having an individual conversation with me or with your CPA and really seeing because like for most of us, there are some way, the ways to strategize around um, the tax part. And so you just want to make sure you don't really, you know, if you don't need to 1031, you don't have to. I, I feel like I see that often where investors are trying to 1031, but they have alternative options. So make sure uh, that you explore everything as you get closer to the, um, um, you know, to the, uh, to the exit when you're considering the 1031. Perfect. Absolutely, Priya. Thank you, guys. I think we're at the end of the questions. So if anyone has anything else, feel free to raise your hand. Um, we can discuss it. Um, it could be related to anything that's real estate related, not necessarily syndications. If not, I will, uh, I will see everyone the next time we have one of our live presentations.